Hello, everybody. Welcome to another live stream for the History Valley Podcast. Today, I'm moderating a debate between John Winford and Sean Andrews, and I will be debating, is the mainstream chronology correct? John Winford will be defending the mainstream chronology, while Sean Andrews will utilize the research of Professor Gunnar Heinzon to challenge the mainstream chronology. So, Sean, I give you 10 minutes to explain your views and an introduction, an introduction argument or words. Okay. And then John <clears throat> will give his views, uh, will introduce his views in his 10 minutes time and then you'll get the rebuttal. So I'm starting to 10 minute timer now. All right. Well, to start off, I mean, mainstream chronology can be taken a lot of different ways. I'm specifically talking about, um, human history, not necessarily, um, the history uh, beyond the Bronze Age and things that happened 10,000 years ago and 60,000 years ago and the uniformitarianistic, uh, gradualistic, Lyle Darwinistic uh, approach. When I talk about chronology, I'm talking about the chronology of human history, which would be specifically the Bronze Age where language systems were developed and cultures were developed. up through including to where we are today, uh, essentially. Um, To put it in a nutshell, we rely heavily on historical sources, so to speak, literature, of which most of these historical quote unquote sources don't have any original documents or original manuscripts to even support. I'm talking about Manetha. I'm talking about Barosis. I'm talking about Josephus. I'm talking about Sextus Africanus. Um, The sources that came at the very, very late end of the first millennium BCE. It would seem from my research that the sources from the Greeks prior to that were much more reliable sources of human history and human cultures at the time than the sources of, again, Manetho, Josephus, Barosis, Sextus Africanus. From my research, it's clear to me that the chronology of Egypt, Mesopotamia, and the biblical chronology is completely erroneous and is anachronistic. That there should never, ever, 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 ever in human history be what you call dark ages or even intermediate periods like in Egypt. There should never be hiatuses of culture where you have cultures that already exist. Never, ever, 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 ever. And I'm going to reiterate that again, because to me, a dark age means it simply didn't happen. A dark ages can't happen. The only time a dark ages happen again is Egypt, Mesopotamia, Greece, um, and Europe between the 5th and 14th centuries. If there are gaps in human history, but yet I'm being taught the history at the high school and collegiate level without sufficient records that were either destroyed somehow, burned somehow, people will say, then how can we tell history accurately if it had to be retold, recompiled, re-chronicled? How do we possibly rely on those sources and those sources are set in stone. So I have issue with um, really the history that we've been given from the 1500s up to our current era, where it's been compiled, it's set in stone prior to any excavations done in any of the monumental cultures, which would be Egypt, Mesopotamia, and I'm gonna also say Palestine. If the written sources and chronologies were correct, it would be a slam dunk within the archeology span and it's not. It simply is not. We have tons and tons and tons of issues within the archeology span where the archeology span does not match the chronology and you can't establish a timeline from just the archeology span alone. It looks very, very, very suspect. It makes then again, Manetho, Barosis, Josephus, and Sexus Africanus leading all the way up to Joseph Justice Scalinger look very suspect again, 
very suspect. Um, I'm going to call a spade a spade. And all I'm going to do tonight is just kind of touch on some bullet points. Uh, the books that I've read about this subject are thick six, 700 page books. Um, it takes a while to actually wrap your head around the arguments that existed during the excavation periods. Arguments that I never, 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 I never knew. They weren't told to me or taught to me in high school or in college. I had to get the arguments and read about the arguments much, much later in my life. So the controversy to me comes down to what do we even consider to be um, historical evidence? Um, I'm going to say that one of the last things I'm going to say, and I don't know how long far I'm into my 10 minutes. We'll take Sally Hemming. I'm going to take a page from one of the books that I actually read by authored by Charles Janainthal. Um, how do we know if Sally Hemming had children to Thomas Jefferson? How do we know that? One source says he didn't father children to Sally Hemming. We have other sources that say he did. How do we know if he did or he didn't? DNA. We have to be extremely empirical. DNA will prove whether or not Thomas Jefferson had children to Sally Hemming. That's it. Written sources to me aren't historical evidence. They're not. Unless for some reason we can corroborate the historical sources. I have a problem then even with the Bible as being a source to certain people, places, and things that the Bible will make mention of. But outside of that book, we can't corroborate whether the Bible is accurate or not. So I don't put much reliance on written sources at all. I need to see the physical empirical evidence and I can determine whether or not the historical sources in chronology is correct or not. I have to be the one to determine that. Not any PhD professors, not an outside external authority. I had to internalize the authority myself, which I would say is the first step in the first stage of being intellectually responsible. Very first stage. You can't internalize authority and say, well, this is my authority because this is what I believe. Well, hold on. Did you take all the necessary steps in problem solving, just like a forensic expert would do? You can go to a, a crime scene or a murder scene. And the newscasters get there and 10 different people give you 10 different stories till the forensic experts come out and they look and evaluate the actual physical evidence. OK, gunshots came from here and this person was over there. Gunshots came from this window. No different than uh, Custer and Sitting Bull. Who won that battle? Did the U.S. Cavalry win or did the Native Americans win? Well, there's two different conflicting so sources that say one side one or the other side won until experts we'll call them at the time went there and started counting shell casings and looking where the bullets were being fired from did they determine that undoubtedly the native americans won that battle that's how it's done it's extremely extremely empirical and if the empirical evidence conflicts with the written sources well the written sources are just wrong and then we can't just try to reason these historical sources away and say ah well you know what Maybe it's uh, because of this, or maybe it's because of that, or maybe we're missing something. No, the historical sources are just wrong. The actual physical evidence tells the tale of the tape of when, who, and how, not the written sources themselves, which are mainly fragmented. And somehow today, they're not fragmented, and we have complete sources of works that were fragmented, like Manetha, like the Bible, somehow written to completion, without the supporting document to show how they were written to completion. You would get an F on a paper in college or even in high school, a term paper. And you don't show your three by five note cards and how you compiled the information. How'd you put this together? I don't want to see the, the finished product. The English teacher wants to see how what steps you took to get the finished product. So I have a problem with a lot of that. So I rely heavily on empirical evidence and let the empirical evidence, evidence determine the chronology in the history, not just the history we have itself. That means that we're blind believers, essentially. I hate to say it that way, but it means we're just being blind believers. And, you know, I'll further talk about it as we go along. Uh, I think it's going to be a really good conversation tonight, though. But I'll, I'll yield my time and uh, yield my time on the floor uh, so that he can introduce his uh, opening statements. Thanks, Jacob.
You had about um, 44 seconds left on the timer. That's fine. Um, yep. Okay, John, you want to begin? Good evening. And uh, good evening, Sean. Yeah, the gaps in the civilization, uh, many civilization rise and fall. Uh, some rise and fall for war, some rise and fall for mental re environmental reasons such as drought, uh, disease, et cetera. So um, the gaps, as he speaks of, it's, it's very typical to see civilizations not um, live through. Times weren't peaceful. They were warring times. Uh, so there, that kind of argument, I don't see that there's a clear, concise um, path to follow that argument and substantiate it. Uh, as far as history goes, there's biblical history and there's Roman history. And biblical history is tricky because most of the text from 2,000 years ago is gone. We have, you know, just frac barely fractions of all the texts that existed. Matter of fact, most of the text has been destroyed or lost or gone. So you can't do it like Roman history where they wrote completely or like Chinese history where they've been writing for, for thousands and thousands of years where you can track it. So wanting empirical evidence when the evidence is slight uh, is tough. It doesn't mean things didn't happen. It just means the evidence isn't there. As far as dating goes, the Jewish history, uh, they've been writing things down for 3,000 years. And uh, you can't say that they didn't write from 1,000 um, CE to 200 CE when Pharisaic Judaism um, actual or modern Judaism actually started. Um, on top of that, when you talk about the Bible, the Bible is an accurate history. It wasn't written to be accurate history. Uh, it was written as theology, uh, not as history. So it takes a lot of study and a lot of education. It's not something that you can just read a few books and go, okay, well, this is historical in the Bible and this isn't. It's hard to track down what is historical. As a matter of fact, the two solid foundations of New Testament history, uh, the only things that we're certain about is that Jesus was crucified under Pilate and Caiaphas' reign, which was in the 30 um, CE era. Uh, and then the other one is that he was baptized by John um, a little bit earlier than that. And those are the only two certainties in the New Testament. The rest of it, it's different levels of plausibility based on uh, the textual evidence combined with um, anthropology, both so social and cultural anthropology. And when you get into anthropology, it's not all just willy-nilly or some professor doing that. It's combined with archaeology and everything else. So then when you get into dating, absolutely, carbon dating is not accurate, and there are limits to carbon dating. Um, but even the critics of carbon dating, and I'm not talking about apologists that throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm talking about critics that complain about the carbon dating um, have found that basically because of the atmospheric conditions and different things, uh, there, there is about a 20 year difference, but not 500, not 1000, not anything else. It's fairly accurate for most things. It's not for everything. So you've got to use it in a combination with other things. There's actually people out there that study this to a high degree, and all they do is calibrate the data so that accurate results can be given. Um, and then when you combine it, basically you're looking at, at tree rings uh, that go back 1300 uh, to 13,910 years back, uh, which is would be what he would call empirical through dendrochronology. Uh, you've got tephrochronology, which uh, is basically volcanic ash layers using chemicals to do that. That's all combined with carbon dating. You've got varv chronology, which is basically the study of sediments. You've got uranium thorium dating, which is which dates coral and calcium carbonate, which isn't the same as carbon uh, carbon dating. And now the the new stuff that they have out for dating, which is just amazing in the field, is the thermoluminescence. Uh, optically stimulated luminescence dating uh, is great because you can look at crystals in the ground and see the last time that, that it was exposed to sunlight and heated up. And so basically you can put this in the field in a trench where the, where the dirt is and go down and look at the layers and see. Uh, you, you, it's not empirical, but it's, it's combined with all these other sciences. 
it's it's found to be very very accurate it also matches up with carbon with carbon dating very accurately so it's kind of cool because they can go down in the different stratas stratas and they can tell when they're at a target area and when they are at a target area most of this has been done so many times in different cultures uh, there really isn't much uh, debate in it. You've got, also got electron spin resonance dating. And that's basically, you can look at t tooth enamel and uh, as well as different carbonates and sulfates and date, date those materials that way. And you also have fission track dating, which is thermal tracking of the rocks and the way that they cool. So you can tell when volcanic events and when you dig up ash layers like Vesuvius and you see um, you see a Roman city underneath it, the dating's absolute because you've got carbon dating, you've got, you've got so many different uh, dating methods to accurately date it, plus you have the written record. So that all this, oh, and the other exciting new uh, one was the, D, which he mentioned was the DNA uh, mutation. They do the LCT gene mutation, and they, which can actually show the geographic location where people were at and then uh, it also lets you know the age, uh, the age period when they die. So really cool stuff there between the luminescence dating and the DNA uh, dating. And what's funny is all of those dates tie in with uh, the carbon dating. And then on top of that, you've got uh, speleothems, which is the mineral cave deposits, which we can date certain, certain uh, uh, human activity that way, um, and ice cores. Uh, going back thousands, tens of thousands of years, we can track things. Um, and things have been found. That the, the one that's really important is the, uh, is, the, uh, is the VARV chronology, which is going down through sediment layers. Uh, because we find all kinds of remains from, from human activity from 1,000 to 2,000 in that. If you go through a Roman, Romans existed for a what, 15, 1600 years, the Roman Empire for roughly 500 years, a little over 500 years, but Romans still existed all the way into the 1400s. And if you go through Roman dumps, there's layers of that dump. The deeper you go, the older it gets. And so the Roman history is absolute. There's no, there's no really any credible debates that we're getting out of academia for it. On top of that, you've got histography. And I mean, 500 BC is when cultures started going, hey, let's get together, write down our history. So you start getting written history. The original texts have not survived. Do we expect them to? No. Have they been altered? Possibly. But basically, you're still getting history from different parts of the world. And they really didn't, there, there was no, there is no conspiracy by anyone to change those dates or change uh, history to the winners, so to speak. Um, some changes have been made, but basically we can tell what's going on and all of the, the written records match up with the carbon dating. They match up with all these other dating men that I've mentioned. Um, the Iron Age, uh, the Bronze Age collapsed, 1200 BCE, 1240, 1250, if you want to get technical, 1208 is when the Israelite culture started. And we have writing from this culture from 1000 BC to almost to the current date. There are no holes or there's no gaps in any of this. There's, there's no, and there's an evolution in the writing. And then when we get to the Bible, when we, when we get all the way down to the Iron Age, um, he mentioned yesterday that there, was, that there was some of this and that in different places. Well, the Iron Age took 500 years to expand. It started in, in a few areas, and then the Iron Age worked out globally, and it took 500 years to do that. But make no mistake, by, you know, 1500, um, or I mean, 500 uh, BCE, it was everywhere. Um, so you've got that. Um, as far as when you talk about biblical text, you've got the 10 oldest Bible, Bibles, the Codex Vaticanus, 300 to 305 A.D., uh, you've got the Codos uh, Sinaiticus, uh, 330 to 360 A.D. Um, Codex Alexandria, 400 to 440 A.D. You've got Codex Ephraim, Receptus, 460 A.D. Um, the Aleppo Codex, 
930 AD. So you've got these five different Bibles. And the thing about this, yeah, textual, 20 seconds left. Right. Thing about that textual evidence is you can see an evolution in the text from the oldest as it, as it goes on through age. We don't see any gaps in academia in any of this. Okay. Sean. Yeah, that's a lot. Like, John, we probably could do this for hours and we probably could do it in several parts because, you know, there's a lot to it. We could cover a lot. I could go point by point and just bring up bullet points, but I'll start with Rome. Do you want to do you want it to be timed? Do you, yeah. Do, how are we, do how we doing this? Like how, how much how, do you want to just go or do you want to just go and have cross? How long uh, we get to talk? How are we doing this, uh, Jacob? How we, uh... Well, originally I was going to I was going to uh, have you give you a timed rebuttal to john okay how, how long would you say would that would that be why did you want 10 minutes all right that's fine and you guys don't you know this is like old school talk show okay starting now i, have a, I had a cigarette i have a beer here i just got off work you, you guys we know we talked about this before um first things first in rome oh, there good is, I'm, I'm gonna start now there's nothing superimposed in rome at all period to where we see anything superimposed on each on itself like this we don't OK, there is a destructive layer in Rome aside from any volcanic activity. And that is something that Gunnar Heidson presented on Jacob's show, you know, several months ago. And I have some other slides showing this. There is a layer at the bottom of the excavations. The bottom layer is called Fongo, which is like really black, uh, uh, mineral rich, super dark soil. It's called fongo, dark earth, they call it. I would say from sources I've read, it's charcoal laden. Okay. Then on top of that, you have alluvial fill. So alluvial fill is usually in valleys. And we've been told the story that there was sediments that uh, over time from the ice age melted down. And these sediments slowly formed valleys um, like where I'm from in Western Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh. They say these beautiful valleys were formed from uh, sediments. It took a long, long time to fill in these valleys, et cetera. Well, that's called alluvial fill. And the alluvial fill is at least what they would say from about 20,000 BCE or so. Well, that alluvial fill is dumped on top of Rome. I don't know the agent or what caused that to happen, but the alluvial fill buried Rome. Okay. The Roman Empire, it said that there were three different catastrophes in the first millennium AD. Okay. The excavations occurred, we'll say, generally from 1900 to about 1930. So it's recently excavated, okay? It looked absolutely horrible. There are pictures that were drawings from prior to that, because there aren't many photos, but it was a wreck. Rome wasn't even the capital at that point. Um, Ravenna was. People were planning and building on top of this layer of material that was thrown down from what agent again i don't know either that or they just left aqueducts buried parts of rome completely buried gone when it's excavated everything is at the same strata level and everything looks the same there are no trees to date the trees are burned up they're gone um we've even pointed out professor heinstone that there are sources that look a lot like the revelation story in Roman history than the than it does than the book of Revelation. So I don't buy in this case a volcano or three different destructions within the first millennium AD because it's excavated. Everything's at the same strata level, though. You might say this church was at this period of time. This church is at this period of time and this building or whatever is this period of time. Everything's the same. Basilica floors, the same. They're saying there's Renaissance after Renaissance. Sure, there was. It looks the same. There's no cultural advancement in Rome or in Europe for that point at all for a very long period of time. Then people are actually using trees again for roofs and buildings. They can't build arches and, and aqueducts. The, the uh, aqueducts that I saw after Rome doesn't exist were shoddy. They look horrible. It's like amateur um, bricklayers and are starting to relearn how to do this, relearn how to do this stuff. Um, it looks as if the history of Rome in the first millennium AD was triplicated. 
It looks that way to me from the excavation. There's no archaeology in this layer that was laid down on top of Rome to where the aqueducts is in some places were up to 15 meters buried. Some of the aqueducts, uh, the excavators didn't even realize they were there, but their aqueducts there. Oh, wow. We didn't know that. We uncover the aqueducts. It's not volcanic ash. It is not. It's alluvial fill that doesn't belong where it is. All the way up through uh, Londonium and Ludenwick um, are right next to each other in uh, London. And they're separated by a small channel. And then their history says that in the early part of the first millennium, there was a catastrophe. And in the latter part of the first millennium, there's another catastrophe. Well, because guess what? When it was excavated, streets connect together. There's one catastrophe, guys. Just one. It looks as though there's just one catastrophe. Old streets connecting to, new, to newer streets. It's still, it's still right there. Uh, basilicas throughout Europe, all the way down to including uh, the Near East, all have the same design for over a thousand years from the ruins. They look the same. The design is the same. The basilica floors are the same. Another bullet point about Rome is the Roman archaeology is popping up everywhere. The Viking culture is later than the Roman high Roman culture, imperial culture, imperial era. They have the same exact millefoy um, blown, blown or, or glass vases and glass pottery. It looks as if either the Vikings took this stuff and buried it in the ground at the same strata level, or it happened the Vikings and the uh, Romans uh, in the high imperial ages were contemporaries with each other, which very well could be the case. So when you look at it, all through the Near East, the millefoy blown glass is everywhere, and it's very fine art. It's very difficult to construct, too, from what I was told. It Everything looks the same. So coins look the same. The coins look exactly the same for almost a 1,000 years. So right now, if Donald Trump poses for a portrait and he's dressed like a pilgrim, we're going to laugh. We're going to say, wait a minute, why is Donald Trump dressed like a pilgrim? But for some reason in Rome and in Constantinople, Everybody looks the same and dresses the same for damn near a thousand years. Dressed in the old Roman style, the same swords, the same everything. Why is that? We don't do that right now. And philology, when it comes to language, because you mentioned that too, I'm not buying that. Because in the Dead Sea Scrolls, dated to the second to third centuries BCE, there's no vowel points in Hebrew, okay? Way later in the Aleppo Codex, when we have manuscripts now, presto, there are vowel points with no development of the Hebrew language in between. I'd like somebody to show me that. Show it to me. Show me where the Hebrew language developed from Hebrew with no vowel points in the 2nd, 3rd century BCE to the Aleppo Codex where you have vowel points. There's nothing to show for. It. So I can't buy that either. It's the same way the Ugaritic text um, there are there's there's a story in the Ugaritic text about Anath. Um, I believe she's going to the emissaries of um, I have it in my notes somewhere. These are old notes. Um, the emissaries of Baal. And there is a mention of the sky dew and the fatness of earth in the Ugaritic hymn to Anath of, of Anath. And then you have in the biblical text, uh, Isaac promises Jacob. The, gives him the promises and he rejects Esau. And they also talk about the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth he would get. So what that implies, and there's like a six to 700 year difference of at least in the language of Ugaritic to Hebrew from what they tell us. We don't speak like in Canterbury tale language right now, 700 years after the fact. We just don't. That's trying to make me believe that slang or hip cool phrases from 700 years prior to where we are right now is how we talk right now and we just don't slang actually comes and goes really fast and the way people talked in 1300 ad we don't talk that way now so philologists want to really snowball me into believing that oh no the ugaritic text and the things in the ugaritic text they you know appear in the bible because you know that's just the culture of the time and that's hip and cool and that's the style 700 years Later in language development, sorry, I don't believe that. I have to be able to see the actual development of the language. And I don't see that in Hebrew. I absolutely do not. Everything is supposed to be based on oral tradition. So again, 
to even further like drive my point home because i'm going to talk about egypt later because that's going to become very 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 key because there are historical gaps in egypt and we're led to believe that cultures within egypt fell off for several hundred years i don't know where they had high culture like the nubians for example the nubians supposedly helped the hyksos out in the time of the hyksos we're saying 16 1700 bce generally speaking by the time we get to the 20th dynasty around the end of the 20th dynasty which is approximately a thousand bce approximately nubians fall off disappear boom they pop up and Shabiko and Taharka, or Taharka and Shabiko, are the man now. They're the man. Nubia has high uh, military, uh, extraordinary military. They have culture. They, they have time, Sean. Go ahead. Go, ahead. We'll go to the next round. John, you want a 10-minute? You want to do a 10-minute sure. uh, rebuttal? Okay. Sounds fine. Hey, so when you get into the Ugarit culture, let's just call it Canaanite because that's what they were. And it's not up for debate. It's factual that the Canaanites origin is, uh, I mean, Israelites origin is Canaanite in nature. At least 60 to 80 percent of the original Israelites were Canaanites after the Bronze Age collapse. When the Canaanite city structures um, uh, fell apart, uh, the Semitic members ended up slowly migrating to the highlands of Israel. And we see the proto, the Canaanite alphabet, uh, Israelites factually use the Canaanite alphabet. They use the Canaanite language. They use Canaanite pottery was identical. Uh, you couldn't tell the difference. Their foundations were the same as Canaanite foundations from 1208 uh, BC all the way into 1000 BCE. Um, the Hebrew language didn't last forever. Uh, you had a big switch uh, going to Aramaic. And so all the way down in Jesus' time, you had Hellenistic city speaking Koine Greek. Um, you had Hebrew in the, in the uh, temple, but it was not a, a, a used language. It was a temple language uh, and part of the old scrolls. You had certain, pe certain people that could read and translate and do it, but it wasn't used in daily, um, daily uh, practice. The Aramaic was the oppressed peasants' language and Jesus' language in Galilee. And Hellenistic languages were used in Caesarea, Tiberias, Sepphoris, and Jerusalem, uh, less the Passover season when you had um, when you had everybody converging and you had multiple cultures and languages sharing the unorthodox Judaism uh, that existed. As far as the Roman population goes, you had a major Roman population for uh, during the Roman Empire. You had Romans living before the empire. You had Romans living after the empire. During the empire, they had such um, organizational skills. That's where you're getting your, your aqueducts. Not all the aqueducts were buried. Mo many of the aqueducts never were buried. They've been out in the sun the whole time. Uh, so, yes, certain areas were filled and, and probably filled to put other buildings on top and cover up the old trash. Most of the stones were taken out and repurposed um, when after uh, the Roman Empire had fallen. Um, the thing about the coin, oh, and the Roman population afterwards wasn't a thousandth of, of what it was during the empire. So you didn't have the manpower to make these massive aqueducts or anything like it. So you did get those, you did get shoddy work and uh, and, and, it, and compared to the what the Romans could do in short order, like building the siege tower at Masada, that was an amazing uh, amount of, uh, of uh, uh, engineering in its own right. Uh, but you didn't have engineering. You didn't have that kind of skill afterwards when there there was no population to do that kind of work. It takes manpower, and that didn't exist afterwards. And when you talk about Roman coins, it brings up a pretty cool uh, thing. We have what's called the Caesar's Comet, 44 um, BCE. A comet exploded and was or went by and it was so bright it lit up the night sky for i want to say it was a week five to seven days uh china records this same comet they put it at 42 but we have a saw bright the one of the brightest celestial events ever in history this is where this is important for christianity because this is where augustus uh viewed this celestial event and said it was caesar and 
Caesar is now God and he is now son of God. So that's what started the whole New Testament, son of God, uh, what the Hellenists were calling Jesus. It was based on that same son of God status that the emperor held. Uh, in Jesus' time, after Jesus' death and crucifixion, uh, you could worship uh, a corrupt politician that required tithes, or you could worship the one true God um, through the man who sacrificed everything for the common man and doesn't require tithes, and he wants to save your soul before the end comes. So we see this comet uh, famous for, for that time. Uh, there's no debate, and even the Chinese recorded the same exact celestial event. Now, when you talk about Roman coins, Roman coins in Jesus' time actually had the celestial event on a lot of the coins. This is probably where the uh, New Testament scribes plagiarized the Bethlehem star. Um, many scholars posit this, and um, its I don't see why it wouldn't be. You wouldn't take a lesser event like Halley's Comet and say, hey, this is the son of God and mark his birth with a weaker event than the living emperor who was called son of God had just a few decades earlier. So this was still talked about. It was still on coins in Jesus' time. Uh, it certainly is what started the, uh, is the historical core behind the Bethlehem star. So there is some historicity to the Bethlehem star if you want to look at it that way. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls were mainly Aramaic, and you had, but you had some Kohen text too. But the, but this wasn't text from one period of time. And this this can go back to 300 uh, BCE to a to 100 CE. And if you want to look at it that way, the language spoken in that time was Aramaic, and it was the Hellenistic Kohen Greek. Uh, Hebrew wasn't a common language, so you're not going to get normal Hebrew text in there uh, the way that he's that he wants to see it. Uh, normal Jews, there were no such thing as normal Jews um, in the first century, in the beginning of the first century. Uh, you don't even have what you call Orthodox Judaism until the second century. And then it wasn't even all that orthodox. But during the first century, there was no orthodoxy whatsoever. There were many different sects, many different ways to practice. Due to the lack of textual information, we don't even know how the average oppressed Aramaic Jew practiced because there's no text at all to describe that. So we can guess based on the Hellenistic text. We have All we have is a Hellenistic lens to look at all of Judaism um, less the biblical text. And the biblical te text was even uh, transcribed into Koine uh, for the Hellenistics that love, the Hellenists that loved uh, uh, monotheism so much. I mean, that's how Christianity was born. It was the evolution of, of Roman monotheism uh, by, their, by their Hellenistic uh, residents that wanted monotheism with the great background of Judaism. And so they changed it for their own needs. It was just basically Judaism light, um, and it evolved that way. And the Jews uh, wrote a lot of polemic against it uh, very early on, um, and they kept writing. So you you can't. There is no gap from from one thousand or from CE to one thousand and two thousand. Jews wrote that whole time. There's no missing. There is not a lot of missing text. And since we have text that go, original text that goes back to 300, 400, and 500, um, what he's saying really doesn't apply because we have it. Uh, we have that text. Now, he may not like the dating. He may argue with the dating. That's fine. Uh, but it's not debated in any academic setting anywhere. So uh, he's got a fringe theory. Um I don't know how he stays with it. I'd love to help him <laughs> overcome it. Uh, I don't know if I can or not. I don't think this evidence is going to, uh, I think he's already fighting against it. So I would love to help him out, but um, he's welcome. Have the floor, please. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, okay. John, go ahead, go ahead, Jacob. I was just switching the screens. Go ahead, Sean. Well, John, there's a lot that I would agree with what you're saying. It was very eloquently put, and that's what we've been taught and told. I don't have a problem with what we've been taught and told, and in, in, in a certain sense, from a certain sense and standpoint, until we start getting into the nitty gritty of everything. It sounds good. It sounds really, really good. And 
fringe. Well, I wouldn't use the word fringe, but yes, I am a person who has read Velikovsky. I'm a person that really cuts to the chase when it comes to how empirical evidence is looked at. And the stories sound great. I don't have a problem with the comment. I don't have a pro the problem with the comment of, Ch of Chinese people recording the comment. I don't have a problem with the Romans recording the comment. I don't have any problem with some of the, some of what you said, but I do have a problem with how we have the established history, at least until 1500-ish AD, and it's set in stone, essentially, till we go to the excavation sites. Now there is a definite problem. The problem existed at that time in the 1800s when the excavations were happening. Uh, 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 Isaac Newton wrote a paper on chronology revision before any of this even happened. And I'm like, why would Isaac Newton be writing a, a paper to revise chronology even at all? Why would that even be an issue? Well, there is there are huge issues with it. It sounds great, but then there are tons of problems with it. So again, I'm only focusing on what we have in terms of Hebrew fragments from the Dead Sea Scrolls. I don't see any Hebrew development of the language from the Dead Sea Scroll era. Don't have a problem with Greek text. The Greek text exists, but I'm sold stories that, well, there's, you know, so many Hebrew scribes or whatever it is came and they uh, translated the Torah for the Septuagint uh, during the uh, Greek Ptolemaic period, et cetera, et cetera, so on. What did they use to translate? What did they use? There's nothing to translate. You don't have anything to translate. It would maybe lost. Well, where is it? We don't have it, but we have the Greek that comes along first prior to there any Hebrew at all. That's a little flaky to me. It's very flaky to me. But more so, when we get to the time when, when the biblical patriarchs are gone, now we have Solomon and David. They are the guys. They are everything that there is when it comes to the Bible. But there is a Greek Dark Age that happens in, 12, in, in around 1200 BCE, a Greek Dark Age and an Anatolian Dark Age. There's a Mesopotamian Dark Age and an Egyptian Dark Age from 1200 BCE to 700 BCE. There's absolutely a dark age. You can say there's decline in the cultures. There's no records of it. It's really what it comes down to. And now the kings of Israel, they got it popping. David got it popping. Solomon got it popping. Jeroboam and Roabom and on down through. Then presto, out of nowhere, the Nubians who already had a dark age. The Nubians have about a 350-year dark age with nothing. Pop back up on the scene with a military, culture, writings, etc., Whereas when, whenever the excavations occurred, the only explanation for that was, well, the Nubians were imitating the Egyptians. Hmm. Well, that means what they would have had to have done is went down into Egyptian tombs, copied how coffins were made to the T, all the inscriptions, and everything was copied exactly to the T. I don't buy that, number one. So when we go back to how we swung from the Bronze Age into the Iron Age. There are a lot of problems with that when it comes to archaeology, because now we have diorite, we have granite that are being carved into. OK, we cannot carve into to granite or to die in diorite to this day without carburized steel with precision. It doesn't work any other kind of way. So, like, for instance, the codes of Hammurabi, I'm going to use that as my best example. The codes of Hammurabi are carved into black diorite, precise, extremely precise. At the beginning of the Iron Age, or just slightly at the, towards the beginning of the Iron Age, and we have Egyptian artifacts prior to the Iron Age that you would have had to have carburized steel to do, to carbon to diorite, granite, basalt, they're hard. And that we're told the, the, the Egyptians were latecomers in the Iron Age anyway. But yet, when Flinders Petrie, one of the greatest archaeologists of all times, one of the biggest conflicts in his archaeology archaeological finds is an abydos and what they call here if i'm going to pronounce it correctly hierarchiopolis okay i'm going to read this though there are beads from in here in abydos or in hierarchiopolis there are beads from the sixth dynasty 2345 the 12th dynasty 1991 bce the 18th dynasty 1570 
the 26th dynasty between 664 and 525 BCE, all in the same strata level. They're all in the same strata level, and they shouldn't be. You shouldn't have the old kingdom and the new kingdom and then the, or the middle kingdom and new kingdom unable to differentiate. It looks in, like in Egypt because they weren't superimposing and building structures on top of ruins. You should not have that over thousands of years, the archaeology mixed in together. It looks contemporary, but then there was problems with it. So they, you know, uh, I would say that Flinders Petrie wiggled around it and really couldn't explain it. You have the Narmer Palette in the Old Kingdom, the, um, the copper statue of Pepe. Well, the Narmer Palette is 3100 BCE. The copper statue of Pepe is 2345. The Palette of Tutmos, 18th Dynasty, 1506. The vase of Nietzsche, which is 26th Dynasty, 664 to 525. And late Dynasty inscriptions um, and 11th Dynasty artifacts, all in the same strata level in Abydos. And there's no explanation for it. You really can't really say too much about it because some people don't even know that's what happened. You have other examples where Petrie... There's excavations in Palestine, 600 BCE. They got this. They find 32 scarabs in this it, for dated 600 BCE. And guess who the people were paying taxes to? Amenhotep and Tutmos. What did Petrie say? These are forgeries because they're a thousand years out of date. The science and technology even doesn't make sense in Egypt at all. It just doesn't make any sense. You can't use bronze and copper to carve into diorite at all. And then in Old Kingdom tombs, there have been found iron spears, which doesn't make sense again. You have iron prior to the Iron Age. You have materials, heck, in the pyramids, whenever they blew the hole in the Great Pyramid, it's the first thing they find in the pyramid is molten, melded iron. Why? Why is iron, what's iron doing in the Great Pyramid? Just right there. Oh, well, they did that during the Iron Age and they just closed it off. Or the people that excavated it, you know, whatever the, they put the iron in there. I guess it. These things don't start. They don't add up. And I have the books to show that they didn't add up. There's been controversies about this going way back. But then you got Judah and Israel intertwined into dark ages, and they their story sounds great. We can't find the archaeology for it. It seems as though the archaeology is misdated. Elite Mazar. Proto and Ola capitals. The capitals that we found in Medigo, Gezer, and Hazor are dated way later than they should be. So they called some of the capitals Proto and Ola capitals, which would be 1000 BCE. Maybe David and Solomon don't belong in 1000 BCE. Maybe they belong in the 600th period, and the whole thing is just out of whack. I mean, I see it as wackadoodle. Most people haven't read the books that I've read at all, but I see a wackadoodle argument that is going on and eventually you know with the oriental institute university of chicago um and james henry's breast its time the consensus chronology wins though we see all kind of and they're not anomalies especially in egypt i'm just pinpointing some of the bullet points they're not anomalies it looks like the retellers of history i.e manetho josephus barosis and um africanus got it wrong and the greek chroniclers prior to that got it right to say that all the cultures really only go back to about a thousand bce or about 1200 bce for the bronze into the iron age from the iron age into what we'll call the fall of rome second century bce there's a gap of 700 years there snap the gap together and look at the historical record all we want to look at it looks like we have 2,500 continuous years of human history, and that's really all we got. And some of what I have, like I said, I mean, these notes I took were from seven, eight years ago. But we have these fixed dates that just don't make sense in terms of what we have archaeologically. It makes no sense at all. Um, I'll yield my time, and we can just you know keep it moving because there's some things that I agree with, and I'm bringing up information that, again, I didn't know about until about seven, eight years ago maybe. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, we have to maybe take a closer look at everything and or some of these books that I have 
need to be revised and republished. So just so I can be specific, this is a cross-examination phase. So you both are supposed okay. to be interacting with each other. Oh, my bad. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to, to uh, touch on David and Solomon. As written, they're fictional. They existed. They they barely have historicity, but they were tribal chiefs. And archaeology backs that up. There really was no united monarchy. The, mm -hmm. the old biblical text going back that far has never been accurate. And again, it wasn't written. It, it was written as history, but it was pseudo history. The Exodus is written as fictional. It, it never happened because of the factual Canaanite origins for the most part of the Semitic people that joined. The 12 tribes are, for the most part, fictional, that they really never existed. You had multi, it was kind of a loose Confederate tag team of tribes uh, that, that David probably started out as a, as a tribal chief. Um, and when you talk about Mazar, uh, most of her work and his were, were, were not all that credible. Right now, Israel Finken, Finkelstein is the, uh, is the man, so to speak, at the top of the hill that's setting historicity straight. Mazar tended to be uh, uh, pretty much biased and apologetic and, and really promoted a united kingdom that, that really doesn't exist and academia really doesn't follow with it. Um, and when you talk about characters like Abraham, Moses, Noah, Adam and Eve, 100% fictional. To this date, there's no historical core. And even if there was a historical core to Moses, I would love there to be one. Moses will never be a historical character as written, not in any way, shape, or form. Um, when it comes to granite and diorite, so I'm a water well driller by trade. I, I use, I drilled through granite. I'm a, a not a decent geologist, but I'm okay. I've, I've, I've worked with hard rock my whole life. So uh, mm. pretty slick with it. But you could take... Um, rope and you could put sand and water on it and you can carve through granite in short order with the proper tools. We've actually seen the large saws, uh, the copper saws uh, that they actually use to cut cut blocks of granite. Uh, so you can use copper, water and sand and go through that. You can chip away at diorite with diorite and you can shape it. But most of the, we, when we, when we do archeology span and we dig up the obelisk sites, we find the diorite stones and what they were doing basically was taking these uh, diorite stones. They were building fires in the granite to soften it up, to weaken it. And then they were using the diorite to beat it out, start another fire, beat it out. And they did this with massive manpower. Um, as far as the dating goes, there's, we, we really don't see a gap in the dating. And what I'd, what I'd be curious about, or if you could answer is, is what did take place from a thousand uh, from the common area, so zero in time for the next thousand years. Um, you haven't, we, we know what happened, but I want to know what you think or your hypothesis, what is your hypothesis put in that thousand year period? Or, and if you want to just do the 500 year period from 500 uh, CE to zero CE, what happened in that five, 500 year period? What was going on in the world at that time? Are you Go asking ahead. me a question? Yeah, yes, sir. Oh, okay, well, let, let me say it this way. To make it real easy and simple, we can look at the standard Egyptian chronology. Let's I'm I'm, I'm going to ha hamper more on that. Take the take the intermediate periods out, okay? Going to close the gaps down, okay? We're still going to rely on Greek history because the Greek history actually matches the strata more than anything we have. Not, the, I'm not talking about Barosis, Manetho, Josephus, and I'm not talking about, I'm talking about Greek history prior to that. We're going to take the intermediate periods or any dark ages we have out and snap and close the gap. It looks like all the monumental cultures, I'm going to say Greece, early Rome, Mesopotamia, Egypt, India, China, and Mesoamerica all started at around 1200 to 1500 BCE, no later. Look at it that way. Let's bring the Bronze Age up 1500 years at least. Okay, can I okay. can I interject a little bit here? Using using the Varv chronology, which is dating sediments in the yearly and seasonal floods, we can go back 5000 years and see the yearly floods for 5000 years in Mesopotamia because they had floodplains and they did it didn't flood every year, but the river 
changed places so much that we can fill in the gaps without messing up the data or without there being any inconcise data. And we've got ruins going back 5,000 years where they didn't, where they built next to the river. They didn't know the floodplain. So the main one is uh, there was a huge flood in 29, uh, 2900 BCE. Uh, so 4,900 years ago, we see a major flood that wiped out a city in Mesopotamia uh, when the Euphrates overflowed. Um, and there were multiple cities up and down the bank and it wiped, wiped them out uh, completely. So there was massive dev devastation. We think that's where the biblical... Uh, the historical core is to the um, to Noah's flood uh, since the Israelites were in Mesopotamia during that uh, during that uh, when while they were there they plagiarized their myths their flood myths and turned it into a bigger flood myth than the the ones that they borrowed from uh, but anyway I, how do you how well, that, can you that's, I mean I, I I think we had to talk I don't disagree that when you excavate Mesopotamia the farther you go down you hit water and there, there's a floodplain at least or water table at least where there's still um building structure and you just can't go down any further than that we had a flood in johnstown pennsylvania that's where i'm from originally 1889 the great flood you can read about it 1936 and 1977 okay the, there are parts of the city that still stand from the major disaster in 1889 it's called the stone bridge it's an arch bridge that's still there but Everything else is definitely different now. You have uh, channeled uh, rivers now, like, like in California, where you actually dig down and you put walls up and you, you lower the rivers so that it can handle the amount of water. So that's within 100 years. I was alive in 77. My grandfather was li alive in 36. I wasn't alive in 1889. But those three events happened within a very short period of time. It wasn't over thousands of years at all. And the only way we know what happened is because we have high water marks. We have a high water mark they'll show from 19, 1889, 1936, and 1977. And then we have the pictures now that we can corroborate with that. To throw a date out to say 2900 BCE, this happened. In 1700 BCE, this, this happened. I don't buy it at all. It could have happened within a very shorter period of time. All I'm trying to get at is if we use the Greek dates and look at what the Greeks say, because we say the Greeks are a later culture anyway, um, coming from Mycenaean culture, the Greek dating system looks like it's more accurate according to what the strata reveals than any other dating system that we have. It looks that theirs is more accurate to what we have actually in the ground. Now, in terms of radiocarbon dating and tree ring dating and other ter terms of dating, for radiocarbon dating, first of all, it doesn't necessarily match with the ancient times, but that means that the sun's radiation has been the same for four and a half billion years with no changes. The cost, there's a constant rate of, rate of decay of carbon. Electrical charge will change that, but that's another whole argument. There's another argument behind that, so I don't think we disagree there. Uh, the, no, I, I, I disagree greatly because car, radiocarbon dating is basically taking the C12 and C14 isotope yeah. and they're measuring it. Here's the whole thing. If the sun's radiation was any stronger, it would have burned off all the life on the planet. So I think we can both agree that we've had, it it's, hasn't been perfectly even, but it hasn't been, there's no major swings in it or it would burn us. It we would, know that. We don't know up? that. We don't know that there were major swings. We don't well, know that there were major swings or not. Now that's getting well, into a whole The measurements in know. the rocks themselves through different time period and different strata show that. But so getting back to quickly, the right. you, you said some things, but you didn't tell me what happened. Were the people from the current area to 500 CE, were they semi-nomadic? Were they agrarian? Uh, there were no, no cities. I would say, I, 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 I would, so then what I'm, I'm saying is that I, I can see the Neolithic period not being more than from 1950, counting backwards, about 2,500 years. I could see that easily. The Neolithic period may not have been that far back. And though, and what you're saying, or what we would think that would happen prior to like, we'll just say generally speaking, 10,500 BCE up to the Stone Age, we'll just call that 5,000 or so BCE. That may not have been that far removed in our past because human remains are only in about the top 
15 meters of strata, period. I don't know if Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon were as far removed as they say they are. I don't know if Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal weren't actually human beings themselves and they were intelligent beings that were our predecessors. Because when we look at, let's say, Alaska and Siberia, we have animals that are tumbled around in the strata, charred, charcoal burnt, trees are splintered, they're burnt. Um, some animals have food in their mouth. The food doesn't exist in Siberia, nor does it exist in Alaska, that they would have had to eat, whether it be horses, rhinoceroses, or elephants. They don't even belong where that area is right now. So to see some of the devastation and destruction that's there, we could easily say, well, that happened 30 million years ago, man. You know, there was a meteor hit the earth, pow, and wiped it out. We have movies like uh, Ice Age and stuff that depicts it in such an eloquent manner. I don't know that because I'm like, well, damn, if you have fossilized, partially fossilized animals and then the um, top halves of the animals aren't fossilized and they have food in their mouth that doesn't exist there, I don't know when that happened. That could have been something that only happened 2,500 or 3,000 years ago. I don't know that. The story says it happened okay. a long time ago, but I don't know what that. What I'm trying to ask from right. is what were people like from uh, from 2,000 years ago to 1,500 years ago? What were people like? Were there cities, civilizations? Uh, what happened? Were they semi-nomadic? Were they no all completely nomadic? What I, I'm trying to get from you is, is were there cities at that time? I, I'm saying the cities that we have, which would be in Egypt, Mesopotamia, yeah. throughout right. the world, probably only culminated in about 12 to 1500 BCE rather than 3100. Of, of okay, so so before 1500, well, the, the right now the chronology goes back 5000 years, not right. uh, not 3500. Okay, um, I say 3500 generally because that's okay, kind of so. Where, so you think people were nomadic and semi-nomadic hunter-gatherers from 1,500 years ago back? Is that it, correct? It, it, it could be that way, yes. It could be that way. It seems that way. It seems that the timeline of our history is here when we have it, you know, here. And it's like, it doesn't have to be. I don't have to have it back that far. I don't have to have the younger Dryas in the Stone Age being so far removed from our past. I don't need that. I, I need to see it realistically and if i snap it together take the gaps out take the erroneous dating out of it and just look at the archaeology in the in the um uh monumental cultures that's all i need to go by i don't have a problem with them because we know it used to be 5000 bc but now they're saying maybe 3100 3200 bce as far as the monumental culture rise i don't have a problem with it being 1200 or 1500 bc i don't have a problem with that at all we're just moving things closer together but it paints an uglier picture because uniformitarianism and gradualism paints a much more pleasant picture. It happened gradually rather than even a biblical, the biblical narrative to whereas we don't know how creation happened, but we know human beings are off the chains. We are fighting. We are cutting each other's phallics off. We are scalping each other. Recently, human sacrifice, animal sacrifice. Um, this behavior is very, very erratic. There has to be a driver behind the erratic behavior. Could it be devastating uh, uh, events in our human development that we just didn't understand and it triggered us to be this way? Maybe. I just don't need the big gaps. I can close the gaps down this close and say, I can still see it. Now I can see it clear. Oh, but it's ugly then. It's very well, ugly. Maybe we don't want to deal with the ugliness. History has always past. been ugly and humans are ugly if you get down uh -huh. to it. Uh, two quick questions for you. Do you the 4.6 billion years is what the scientific age of the Earth is. And the, and then uh, do you believe in that? And then the next question is, do you believe in evolution? I don't believe in the 4.5 billion years. I mean, that's a story. Right. Can't. It's just so far removed. It's like you can tell me anything, man. It's okay. clockwork. It's no evolution. Now, here's the twist to that from primates and the way they say it happened. Absolutely not. I only got to look back at what our predecessors would have been, which would have been um, Cro-Magnon, essentially Neanderthal, or any other archaic type of um, humans or pre-humans, whether it be in Africa, I don't care where it was, to where is what I was talking about with the, with the megafauna extinction. That may have only been, let's say, 3,500 years ago from where we are right now. 
the animals still exist. Rhinoceroses, horses, elephants are just smaller. Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon look a lot like us, but we're just a little bit smaller. It looks like evolution may work different than what we see because there's no transitional species. Maybe we don't have to have any, but calendars change. So that's another whole subject. We have, a, we have a complete line of transitional species from from Homo sapiens going way back. There's a few missing gaps, but the picture yeah. is is filled in quite a bit. And evolution doesn't really work like a ladder. It's not like you go one to the next. It, it's kind of like a, a tree or a bush, so to speak. But right, anyway, right. I won't get into that with you. It was just I, I was just curious where you. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm a radicalist. I, I'm a, I'm a neo catastrophist. I am pers a person that was looking at everything I possibly could. At least we'll say 93. I got out of college. So from 93 to like 97, I was just doing what I was doing from 97 to about 2002. I started getting to radical religious stuff, uh, namely the black Hebrew Israelites, which is a whole nother subject for me. No, well. And I said, OK, that doesn't seem to be the answer. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to empty out what's in there. I don't know anything. And I have to relook at everything. And I'm going to just keep looking and say, hey, if I don't agree with consensus science or consensus uh, history, I just don't agree with it. And here's why. But again, it was Velikovsky's inspiration that, you know, he could have been the most um, inspirational writer of the 20th century. But instead, he became um, the most controversial writer of the 20th century. And, you know, from what he wrote, people, especially the science community, hammered down on him hammered down on them and hammered down on them. And it's like, wow, we're not allowed to think independently. We're not allowed to um, look at things a different way. We're not allowed to gather more evidence and say, maybe us human beings don't have all the answers scientifically, historically, or even religiously. And we may be just so arrogant and egotistical that we think we do. And maybe science is on the wrong path. History is on the wrong path. Religion is on the wrong path. It could be that way. But again, from the circles that I swing with, it is very, very radical. It's a very radical reinterpretation of human history. And it takes us as the individual and places the burden on us to either be academically and um, intellectually responsible or not. And those people that I follow and have dealt with may not have all the answers either, but at least opens the door to say, hey, maybe we don't know everything. Maybe we're not looking at this stuff the right way. Um, or there wouldn't be any controversy in the first place. So it's very radical. The way I think and the way I look at things is very radical. It's extremely radical. And some people go, oh, man, that's that's too much. Well, I'm reading the arguments, um, you know, like I said, from some of the notes that I've taken over the years in this old uh, 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 composition book. And I'm just, you know, we're, we're having a great uh, a great debate or conversation, if you will. I just see things a completely different way. And I need to rely on as much empirical evidence as I possibly can. And the interpretation of the empirical evidence is subjective. I would say with you, with me, with anybody, but it should be objective. We could all have bias. And I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I try not to have bias. Um, but the way I see things, it could be totally different than the way it's been and told and taught to us. You know? Uh yeah, I see Jacob coming on. Are we are we over our time limit, Jacob? I mean. <laughs> well, I'm thinking that um, based on the way I see the conversation going, do you both want to make a closing statement and then end the discussion tonight? Yeah, I can. just need a couple minutes and I'm done. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, who wants to go first? I went first. So, John, you want to go first? Fair enough, man. I think with all the different dating methods that we have today, there's no dispute. Um the the when you talk about dendrochronology and tephrochronology, valve chronology, valve chronology, the DNA. Um, when you talk about the um, thermoluminescence, all these sciences agree together. There's no conspiracy against it. It all matches up. There's some problems with uh, with carbon dating. Nobody nobody doubts that, um, but it all matches, and there are no gaps. Um, 
evolution is a factual science. It's not guessed at, and and it's basically empirical to the point that um, scientists observe and report. That's all that they do. Um, do they use science for dating? Absolutely. Could they be wrong? Yes, they, they could. And sometimes they are. The beautiful thing about science and current academic science is when they make mistakes, they correct themselves. So when we had problems with carbon dating, um, hey, it's off, to, you know, it could be off as much as 20 years. That was a new thing. But we've got checks and balances that check that out, that make sure that calibrates the errors. And we have that. We've got a graph that shows the different environmental factors that change it. And I tell you what, due to the smog and and the and the quote unquote global warming that we're supposed to be having uh, and have actually, um, they're going to have a hell of a time with carbon dating in the future when they're looking back at us a thousand years uh, in the future. So I guess in closing, there, there are no um, errors in the dating, so to speak. It's scientific. It's observed. It's not in question. Um, fringe theorists can question it, and many do. Young Earth creationists uh, will never agree to um, facts, uh, no matter how well I present a fact to a Young Earth creationist. And I'm not calling uh, Sean that in any means. I'm just using it as, as, as an example in this doesn't may not may or may not apply to Sean. I don't know, but no no matter how well I explain uh, facts, you can't get through when somebody has fanaticism or fundamentalism. And I don't think Sean has that. I think uh, I don't want to uh, guess to why Sean thinks the way he does. I'm glad that he's thinking outside the box. I'm glad that he that he doesn't that he is questioning everything. I, that's in that's is an important part of science. Um, but with checks and balances, you try to keep it in the middle of the road instead of far right or far left. And um, uh, Sean, I thank you for the, for your time this evening. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, John. Thanks you a bet. lot, John. In, in closing, I would like to say that I could take a pro or con stance anyway. I could be pro creationist. I could be pro evolutionist. And I say both are wrong. We're in the middle of something that doesn't seem like each side has quote unquote facts. And that's the arrogance and the ego of human beings. Nothing is settled. And realistically, we don't want to look at reality for what it actually is. I think that the evolutionists were academically irresponsible, I, as well as I do the creationists were academically and intellectually irresponsible. And we're in, a, in an evolutionary state from the 18th to the 19th to the 20th centuries, we got it all figured out. I don't think we got it all figured out and we're afraid to admit that. We have fear in admitting that we're wrong or that we don't have everything figured out. It would be a bad look. Science isn't settled. History isn't settled. Theology isn't settled. None of them are settled. And until we actually take the inward journey and we actually take full and total control of our internal authority and aren't afraid to say, guess what? I was wrong. Maybe these people are wrong. Maybe those people over there are wrong. Then we're just going to keep going down the wrong path scientifically, historically, and religiously, I would say, in, in my personal opinion. Everything starts on the fringe. There was no peer review for anything, any science that led to the technology we have today. Either it works or it doesn't work. Now we have these checks and balances, but then these checks and balances could have institutionalized bias within these rank and files, if you will. There could be institutionalized bias, and I think there is institutionalized bias historically and scientifically. I am looking and thinking outside the box, and I'm not afraid to say, hey, I'm not, I may be ignorant of things, but I'm not ignoring of anything. I'm going to say, hey, I'm not afraid to say, I don't agree with either side. And I'm sitting in the middle of it like, man, what? look at this, you know, look at how we are as human beings. No, I'm right. No, I'm right. What if we're all wrong? Are we afraid to admit that we're wrong? I would say scientifically, yes. I would say historically, yes. Um, That's just where I am. And, you know, 
looks like we're both older and we had a really great conversation. <laughs> I'm in a different place because I won't accept things the way they are because the reality of outside of what we're being taught, told, and the way we look at history and science, whatever, the reality of the world is way different. We're in an indifferent world, a cruel world, um, that, and nature doesn't care about you at all. We're victims of that. We, there's nothing we can do about natural disasters. There's nothing we can do to stop it. Um, if there is a person that's a god or has would have that title of god, I don't think there's anybody in the universe worthy of that title. Because then that would have to do with the enhancement and sustenance of my life. And there's nothing external to myself that does that except for the sun right now, you know, in a nutshell. Um, but I'm always going to question. I'm always going to be a skeptic. I'm always going to look at the argument to see if, again, historical sources versus archaeology is correct. Whether scientists are 100% predictive at all times. I'll never call anything a fact, ever. This is a fact. Nope, it's not a fact to me. I, 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 can't, I cannot um, ever concede to saying something is a fact. Something that is a fact is something that's axiomatic. That's self-evident. I don't have to know that fire will burn me. I don't have to know that if I try to jump off the roof of my house, I'm probably going to break my leg and there's a possibility I can die. Those are things that are axiomatic and they're self-evident. So really what we should be talking about are the things that we know are self-evident and axiomatic instead of the things that we don't know are self-evident and axiomatic. That's really the, the, the Pepsi challenge, I call it. And um you know, I'm always going to be the radical that I am and look at things the way I look at them. You know, um, I have reason to be a radical, I, I guess. I grew up in the hip hop generation. Question everything. Don't take anybody's word for anything. I can't walk down the street and somebody pull out three cards and say, hey, I'm going to show you a trick and I'm going to play three card Molly. Where's the ace? I can't fall for the ball underneath the, um, the shell trick either. So things that we've been taught and told the egos of people say that they're facts, but I don't know if they're facts. I don't think they're facts. I don't think evolution is a fact. I don't think uh, creationism is a fact. I don't think standard science is a fact. I don't think chronology is a fact, and the history we've been given is a fact. You know, um, that's just the way I'm going to think. And, you know, I would like to, instead of injecting what I think into people, I'd rather inspire people to read what I've read and maybe people will take the next step and say, Hey, you know what? Maybe I'm wrong. I've admitted that to myself, you know, many, many years ago, I don't know anything. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I need to really soul search and try to figure these things out for myself. You know, otherwise, you know, John, great conversation. It was a great conversation last <laughs> night. Pleasure. Excellent conversation, man. You know, um, I appreciate Jacob for having us on the show and everything. And of course maybe we can do it again. It was kind of off the cuff, but oh, yeah, there'll definitely be a part two. All good. It might even be a two versus two next time. <laughs> Maybe. Well, I thank you both for joining me tonight. This has been a great discussion, great debate, very cordial, and I'll see all of you later. Thanks a lot again, guys. All right. Have a good evening. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.